many people are very curious about the origin of the China system. At least I am. So um, could you give us a story? Sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, actually, the uh, idea uh, began in a meeting back in uh, 1984 that was sponsored by the MacArthur Foundation. Uh, they were looking for innovative projects to fund in child development. And uh, both Catherine Snow and I were at this meeting. Uh, it was in San Diego. And we both came up with the idea at this very same time. So I, I think it was an uh, interesting coincidence. The idea was uh, that child language researchers had been doing all their work really based on using um, paper and pencil methodology, really. Uh, even goes back to Darwin, who used note cards. And at that time, in 1984, everybody was starting to use personal computers. So we, we thought, well, really, we should be putting our data in computers. And uh, I think it was very obvious to everybody that this would be a much better way of looking at child language data. So um, we requested money to uh, organize this system and to take all the data that had it was already uh, uh, transcribed and written on sometimes hand notes, but usually typewritten notes, or sometimes in computer files, and put it into the computer. Uh, and we then organized a meeting in uh, 1984 in Concord, Massachusetts, and that uh, really was the beginning of the system. We had 20 child language researchers uh, came together, and everybody was very enthusiastic, and uh, they agreed to contribute their data, and that was the beginning. Research nowadays is really being driven by uh, the actual computer uh, methodology and equipment down to the level of the hardware. Because remember back in 1984, uh, people really were not using the internet. And we really people had not even started to use CD-ROMs. We were using diskettes. So to distribute the database, we actually had to uh, put the data on diskettes and mail packages of diskettes in the mail which of course was very, in fact they were even not even the little square diskettes, they were the round ones. Uh, so a lot of the revolutions have really been technological revolutions as people got better computers, as they got uh, 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 the internet of course was a huge change because we could then distribute the data over the internet. Another big change really was when we could add audio and video, which I think the Chinese uh, University Bilingual Corpus really represents one of the best examples of linking together um, video data taken from young children and their parents uh, to the transcripts. And now this is becoming the norm for new projects in the area. Video gives you an even clearer idea of who was sitting where, and also it gives you the gestural expressions. Um, now, from a scientific point of view, the, the audio is very important because a lot of times people will transcribe in one way and then later on wish they had transcribed another way. Uh, the, the standards might change. If you have the audio available, you can always go back to match the original audio fact. So it's the real fact of the interaction. And, and to lose that, it was really cutting yourself away from the actual facts of child language. In terms of quality, um, I, I think that one of the problems is that we, as we really develop our ideas about child language, we realize there's more and more we want to transcribe, uh, particularly in the gesture area. Um, and and it's, it's impossible ever to get an accurate transcript. I mean, that is perfectly, uh, uh, you know, would, you would never change a piece of it uh, because you always can see something in an interaction. You say, well, I missed that word, or that overlap wasn't quite right, or I, what about that important gesture? Every time you look at an interaction, you see something a little bit more. So that's why it's important to have that original record so you can always extend and elaborate it with additional features and coding. Um, quality is continually improving, I think. Uh, we also want to improve the quality uh, so that people can make analyses. So um, there's just so much to be said about quality, and that really is our goal. Uh, but coverage, you know, 
Uh, density is important for an individual child. You want to have a lot of visits. But then the other thing we need is we need lots of languages. Mm -hmm. Right now we have, I guess, 34 languages in the database. And uh, there is an overrepresentation, I think, of European languages. Obviously, English, <laughs> Spanish, German, and we want more and more representation of uh, non-European. Asian languages are now becoming more and more uh, represented. We have more and more data on particularly Cantonese and uh, Putonghua, but Thai, Korean, and Japanese also. So those languages are really important because they're very different in structure, and language acquisition theory has to be tested against differences in structure. And of course, the biggest test is bilingualism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How can a child learn two different languages, such as Cantonese and English, uh, and, and still you know, maintain uh, accurate control of both? You know? So I think that's where the Chinese university corpus is really, is really remarkable. Uh, it, it, it is really the only one that is extensively combines both a Western and a non-Western language. We are now able to automatically analyze the parts of speech in a bilingual corpus like the Cantonese English corpus by having both an English grammar, an English lexicon, English morphology that analyzes the English part. And almost like Swiss cheese, there's another part that is the Cantonese part, and that can be analyzed automatically. And, and, and the way of doing that is to really recognize how the languages sort of interdigitate because you'll have one sentence that goes in Cantonese, then the child switches back to English. And with inside the English, they may use one word that's in Cantonese. But then you might say, well, the whole interaction is mostly Cantonese. So you really look um, back and forth at what you have to note really fairly clearly, but it's not that hard, uh, which language is being used. And then from there, you take the automatic analysis. So it's really, really so it fun. It works for two <laughs> languages and eventually it could work for trilingual. Yes, languages. absolutely. No, trilingual is, is not a difficult uh, extension. Yes. I mean, I, poor kid that has to learn four languages, I don't know about that. <laughs> it's a privilege. <laughs> it's a privilege, right, right. I think we do have um, one, tri one beginning set of trilingual uh, data, but, but this would encourage people, I think, to, to uh, collect more and more trilingual data. Say a bit more about the future of bilingual acquisition and creation of uh, multilingual corpus. Well, I mean, I think that you're basically the Chinese university corpus, uh, you know, sets the standard in this area um, in terms of oh, what you. should be done, you know, and I think it's up for everybody else now to uh, catch up. Um, there have been, there are uh, something like maybe 15 bilingual corpora. Uh, and but none of them really have have this enormous detail. I shouldn't say there is one other that has video linked to it. It's a Spanish English corpus with Yasmin, um, and there's also a very interesting uh, corpus which has some English in it. But uh, but really in terms of the detail and the coverage, um, and of course the other thing is when you're looking at bilingualism, you want to look at both related languages and languages that are very different. But of course, you have to take you have to take advantage of the situations you have available to you. Yes. And I think the main thing is for bilingual uh, researchers: number one, to definitely rely on multimedia analysis, and number two, really understand that you can do automatic morphosyntactic analysis by this sort of Swiss cheese method I, I mentioned. So, um, again, you know, the, take a look at the Chinese uh, Cantonese English, and you know, see how it's done, basically. Brian, um, do you have anything more to wrap up the interview? Uh, no, not really. I, I um, you know, really want to say that, that I, again, that the success of, the, of this project is really due to the incredible collegiality of all the people, not just in child language, but in these many other fields, conversation analysis, classroom discourse, that have come together and are willing to share their hard-earned hard transcripts with other people. And uh, certainly the Chinese University corpora are great examples of that. So thank you. Very thank much. you. Yeah.